everybody. This is Brian Baugh, creator of the comic book series Wolf and Batsy. And today I thought I'd do a different kind of video. Something I've thought about doing many times, but I never really got around to it. A review of some of my favorite horror comics. Um, I have been collecting horror and monster comics ever since I was a little boy, so I got a pretty vast <laughs> collection of them that I've accumulated over the decades. Here today we have The Haunt of Fear, issue 12, by EC Comics, the great legendary publisher EC Comics, from 1952, although this is a 1973 reprint. So how did I, you know, a kid of the late 70s, early 80s, come to discover and fall in love with EC Comics from the 1950s. Well, I learned about EC Comics from Stephen King. Uh, in 1982, when I was 10 years old, there was a movie that came out called Creep Show. It was directed by George Romero, and all the stories were written by Stephen King, and the great special effects and all the monsters in it were created by Tom Savini. And there was a comic book adaptation illustrated by Bernie Wrightson. And uh, I had the kind of parents who would kind of let me watch whatever I wanted when I was a kid. <laughs> so I saw Creepshow when it came out in 82, uh, got the comic book, read it to death a million times, loved it. Creepshow was as big for me when I was 10 years old as Star Wars or Raiders of the Lost Ark or Jaws or any of the other big movies at the time. And even at that age, I was aware of this guy, Stephen King. Because in the late 70s, early 80s, there was no way not to be aware of Stephen King. His name was everywhere. Every time I'd go to the bookstore with my mom, look at the paperback section, it's just it was like a wall of all of his early novels. And uh, being a fan of monsters and scary stories, I was intrigued. And when Creepshow came out, and I read the Creepshow comic, that was like the first real piece of Stephen King literature <laughs> or writing that I'd ever read from him. And I eventually got his book of short stories, Night Shift, which was an important book for me because it was a bunch of short stories, but they were all collected in a fat little paperback that was the size of a novel. So by going through that whole book and reading all those short stories, I felt like I had read a novel, <laughs> which kind of gave me the confidence to read some of his longer books. Uh, the early classic Stephen King novels Basically, everything he put out from, like, 1974 to 1986 or 7. Uh, that was, for me, in my childhood, kind of like what Harry Potter was for for kids in the next few generations. Uh, where were they, they were these big, long books, but I was so interested that I plowed through all of them. Anyway, being a big Stephen King fan, uh, I also read every interview with him that I could find in every magazine that came out. And... In his interviews, he would talk frequently about EC Comics, these scary horror comics that he loved when he was a boy. And he talked about how Creepshow was completely inspired by the EC Comics. And even in Night Shift, there's a short story called uh, The Boogeyman, where he even mentions ghastly Graham Ingalls, who drew this cover by name. So from this early age, I had this awareness that these... EC Comics existed. And I remember uh, at that age also being sort of like, man, I've, if only I could see those. But from that vantage point in the early 80s, my understanding of comics was comic books were things that came out on the spinner rack at the 7-Eleven or at the grocery store or at the drug store. And <laughs> it's like you got what was available that month on the spinner rack and if you missed it, it was gone the next month, and it would be replaced by a whole bunch of new stuff. And I had no idea where these things went. I just assumed you could never get them again. So when comic book stores became a thing, and we had a comic book store in our town, that was like a revelation for me. <laughs> and at, at some point it clicked in my brain, like, wait a minute. You know, I wonder if... If I, if I look through all those back issue bins where I'm finding all these great back issues of X-Men and Spider-Man, I wonder if somewhere in there I might be able to find these horror comics that Stephen King is always talking about in his interviews. The books that scared him when he was a kid, you know? And, and it was just sort of like, I didn't believe it, was, it, would, it would even be possible. 
But sure enough, on one of my next few visits to my local comic book store, which at that time was the Bookery Fantasy in Fairborn, Ohio, uh, the company still exists. They still have a store in Fairborn called the Bookery, but it's no longer at the original location where a lot of my uh, early comic book uh, memories and dreams and education happened, <laughs> uh, which I miss terribly. But, but uh, oh boy, what great memories of that that old store, the original Bookery. Uh, but anyway, sure enough, you know, from reading the Stephen King interviews, I had the 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 titles: uh, Tales from the Crypt, The Vault of Horror, and The Haunt of Fear. I had those written down on a scrap of paper, and I just started looking in the back issue bins just to see. And lo and behold, I could not believe it, but I saw this. In one of the back issue bins under H, The Haunt of Fear. And I remember pulling this out and seeing this image. And this was the first EC comic that I ever laid eyes on. This is the first piece of Graham Ingalls artwork I ever laid eyes on. Uh, a big deal in my development as a comic book fan and artist, I think. Um, and I was probably, I don't know, 12, 13, maybe, something like that. Uh, and, you know, this is obviously not an original from 1952, but it's a very excellent facsimile, I guess you'd call it. It says number four, but it's, that means it's the fourth reprint in this series of EC Classics, The Haunt of Fear number 12. Uh, there's the copyright date, 1973. So, uh, yeah, this was quite a discovery for me, and I bought it and took it home and, and just... And it became one of my all-time favorite EC Comics issues. I mean, as, as the years would go on, as time would go on, there would be more and more and more reprint books. I would gradually get them all and be able to read them all. And, and, and of course, there's many, many, many favorites that I now have after all these years. But, uh, but this was the first. This, this was... This was my first EC comic. And I love this issue so much that I even got an original. This actually is the 1952 uh, comic book, the original comic that this, that this is reprinted from. Um, I have a pretty decent collection of pre-code horror comics from the 1950s. Uh, you know, like when I became an adult and I was in my 30s and... <laughs> could actually afford, um, I got into collecting the uh, original pre-code horror comics, and this was one I felt like I had to have, because it was just such a big deal to me. I am not going to open this, <laughs> because uh, it's in pretty damn good condition, this copy. Uh, I mean, the, the edges are clean, the corners are nice, there's no markings or scuffs on the cover. It's, it's a pretty nice, clean copy, so I like to try to keep it as pr well protected as I can. But we'll go through this one uh, because it's an excellent reprint. It's absolutely faithful to the original. So here we have a little spotlight on uh, Johnny Craig. We'll see some of his work in this issue. And our first story is drawn by Graham Ingalls, who signed his name Ghastly, the master horror comics artist, not just at EC, but overall. Uh, in my opinion, if you're an artist who likes to draw with ink brushes, I feel like there's a whole education to be had by studying Graham Ingalls brushwork. And it's also a lot uh, better to study the black and white versions for that uh, than the color versions, although I love the color, don't get me wrong. Uh, but but in the, I have the Russ Cochran uh, late 80s black and white uh, reprints, which I can also show on another video sometime, that are printed really large. That's where you really see the quality of it. Just the way he does these tree branches, the fine details, the hair hanging down. A lot of this stuff gets muddied in the newsprint uh, version, uh, where the color ink just kind of drowns it out a little bit, the fine detail of it. But if you get those black and white versions and really look close, you can really see the quality of his inking. It's it's really pretty astonishing, the effects he gets. And this story I just loved from the start because it is it is the classic EC kind of situation uh, where you have a totally innocent character 
who just gets put upon by these heartless evil uh, characters. And uh, ultimately, they find some excuse to do him in in some horrible way. And then, of course, he comes back from the grave as a living corpse to seek his undead revenge. But, I mean, look at the things that Graham Ingalls does here. He has these beautiful dogs breaking the panel borders. Scenes like this. Um, his very simple way of doing these trees, where it's almost almost a silhouette. Um, and this uh, structure here, and these little just wisps of trees in the background, and the figures are silhouetted. I just I just love the way he handles this kind of stuff. It's so simple. Well, it's deceptively simple. You know what I mean? Um, it's structurally correct, and it's all there, but it's but it's also stylized. Look at the lean on these old houses to make them feel old and rotted. And this carriage, you know, I mean, structurally, it's correct. It's there, but it, he drops it into silhouette uh, because it doesn't matter. You don't need to see all the detail. It's it's you get the idea. And his use of foreground objects is something else I've always loved. And of course, you know, again, this is a situation where the color is kind of drowning it out. But if you see a panel like this, a Graham Ingalls panel in black and white, you can really appreciate the work he's doing to frame the center of interest with foreground objects, um, which just makes it so much more interesting. And putting these characters as black silhouettes against the window. You know, that's like, that's like, master illustrator stuff, not just comic book artist, but like illustration. It's what you call good composition. Uh, another example of that here, the center of interest is the house. That's what they're talking about, but he frames it with the two guys and the window. Um, he got an interesting uh, up angle on this shot. And I love his use of shadows, of course, the shadows on faces. I mean, you can tell this is an example of something that Bernie Wrightson took a lot of inspiration from. Wrightson always likes to drop faces into shadow like that. Another nice little dog there. <laughs> and again, here, same kind of thing. Uh, the figures in silhouette in the, in the distance and all this interesting foreground stuff going on. And a lot of people, I don't think, even would pay attention to this. They would just look at whatever... They're supposed to look at, because that's where the story is, right? These two characters talking. But how much more interesting is it to do things like that around them and build the world around them? <laughs> These evil characters. Uh, you can tell Graham Ingalls always had fun making his bad guys just the most despicable humans in the world. Even even the guy's wife has no sympathy. <laughs> And the sweet old man, you know, you just know he's a goner in an EC story because he's just too good. You know, it's one of the basic rules of horror. Uh, the innocent must suffer. <laughs> oh, and things like this, too. Look, uh, so uh, part of the story involves uh, these Valentine's Day cards uh, that are being sent to the sweet old man. And uh, so he does things like this, like he... he you got your panels, and here's a scene here, and here's a, another scene here. And he sort of connects them with this random tree branch that goes through. And it makes, the you know, the branches make a little heart. Of course they do, right? <laughs> uh, it's all decorative, but it's so cool the way he thinks of things like that. I mean, who else does that? Who thinks of things like that? And, uh, of course, this is where... You know, the old man's heart gets broken, and he's crying, and this sad, pathetic face. I love these drapes in the background. Again, all this kind of stuff, this, the branches, this, the drapes, all this kind of stuff is so much... You can appreciate it so much more when you see the black and white versions. Uh, uh, but I, I still love the color. I, I love the, the flat colors. If you're going to do color, I feel like that's the way to do it. Keep it simple. I'm not a big fan of the uh, early 1990s image comic style uh, pseudo airbrush uh, computer coloring technique where everything is like got this sheen and fade and gradient on it. Uh, I much prefer these kind of flat colors that keep it simple. Um, 
More of the same thing. Look at this beautiful old house. The panel is framed by these old trees. Um, and you have the silhouetted figures. Because again, he knows you don't need to detail every one of these characters. You just need to understand it's an angry mob. So he gives you a perfect silhouette of an angry mob. He's, he's very economical, as well as doing all this lush brushwork. In his storytelling, he's economical and keeps it simple. That's important. I like this too. Same thing. Just drops this whole background into black shadow. Because, again, you don't need to see anything else. Um, a lot of modern artists, I think, would leave that white and put in a bunch of unnecessary detail in there. <laughs> Maybe I would too, <laughs> you know? We forget. It's so much more impactful to direct the eye to the characters that are telling the story. Um, and you don't need... There's no information that you need here, so drop it into black shadow. And it even creates atmosphere because you have black shadows in a horror story. That's always helpful. And again, with his nice use of foreground objects to just make the composition more interesting, putting that lamp in the foreground. This is something you see in a lot of old black and white movies. They do this a lot. They'll have the characters talking in the midground, and in the foreground you'll have a table with... Uh, you know, like, I don't know, a vase of flowers or a lamp like this. Uh, James Whale, the director who did The Invisible Man and Frankenstein and The Bride of Frankenstein and The Old Dark House, he did that kind of stuff a lot. You also see this in uh, Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman. There, watch the shots and the compositions in that movie. There's a great use of uh, foreground objects. There's a lot of evidence in Graham Ingalls art, if you study it, um, of him being a big fan of of the black and white horror movies of his era. Um, maybe if I get some of the other issues of his stuff, I can point that out. Uh, of course, here's the panel where the old man hangs himself. <laughs> and we don't need to see him actually hanging from a noose. All we need is the boots in the foreground. <laughs> and these guys looking shocked. And of course, here we go. This is, as a kid, this is what I was waiting for. This is obviously a story that inspired what George Romero and Stephen King were doing with Creepshow, where you have the classic uh, EC Comics, Living Corpse, coming back from the dead for revenge. And just look at that ragged ruin of a decomposed face with all these little bits and dirt and stuff falling off of him and shuffling through the graveyard with these long shadows, more tree branches, interesting shapes, and then this is where he comes in and gets the guy and <laughs> leaves them a uh, a heart, you know. Harkening back to the uh, Valentine's Day theme of the story. And our second story in this issue is On a Dead Man's Chest. And it says it's, this is from the Vault of Horror. It's an interesting thing that the EC Comics would do. You know, every issue was an anthology story. The Old Witch was the host of the Haunt of Fear. Uh... The Vault Keeper was the host of the Vault of Horror comics, and the Crypt Keeper was the host of the Tales from the Crypt comics. So in order to have the different hosts all participating in the issue, the Old Witch, the Vault Keeper, the Crypt Keeper, uh, they would have them appear and have the title of their comic. That's the reason for having the title of the other horror comic in this one because it's a vault of horror story hosted by the vault keeper so this story is called on a dead man's chest uh illustrated by johnny craig another one of the great uh ec artists johnny craig was uh very different from graham ingles he was known more for his uh psychological stories and uh uh his stories were a little less like horror movies and a little bit more like film noir movies um, more about uh, bad people doing bad things. And uh, another guy with just a great sense of composition and an amazing uh, economical style. And I mean, <laughs> talk about composition. What a framing for this shot. Uh, you know, uh, Johnny Craig is also known for being one of the early comic book artists who really kind of used um, human sexuality and eroticism as an element in motivating characters. And, you know, he's doing something extremely subtle that way here. 
um, framing this guy uh, within this triangle of her legs. And, I mean, you know, not to be uh, <laughs> kinky or whatever, but, I mean, he draws these shapes very elegantly. He had an appreciation for women's legs, clearly. Uh, and, and this character does, too, because he's using that to psychologically trap this guy. And again, you know, the woman's in the background, always in the background of this guy's mind. Here she is in this uh, strapless dress. I have to admit, I, it's been a long time since I read this story. I don't remember all the details of what's going on here. Uh, you know, I was always a bigger fan of the monster stories, but I have the utmost respect for uh, Johnny Craig's artwork. One of the things I love so much about Johnny Craig's art is the way he draws hair. Uh, look at that right there, you know? The simple inking technique creating this uh, wavy uh, style of this guy's hair. And look at this pose. That's, that's pretty amazing. This is one of those things you don't think about being challenging, uh, but it is. Uh, I remember when I was in art school, I had a had an art teacher uh, who was a professional illustrator. And I remember him telling us one time, he said, uh, there's so many aspects of human behavior and uh, human anatomy that are so tricky to draw that you don't even think about. Like he, and he pointed, as an example, he said, have you ever tried to draw two people kissing? and not make them look ugly. He goes, try it. It's not easy. Look, I mean, you don't see her face or his face at all. Um, but somehow he gets all that emotion across just in their gestures. The way he's sweeping her into him like this and she's curving into him. You feel the intensity of uh, what's going on there. Look at that. This is the kind of stuff I find impressive. Um, so few comic book artists these days use black or know how to use black. Um, there's so little solid black shadows in comics these days. One of the things I don't like about modern comics is when they draw every panel with these thin, wispy, thin lines and everything is open and white and there's no use of blacks. Look at this, the way he frames that, you know? Look at that panel. The shadow, the solid black shadow on her face and on her arm, emphasizing the flare of that gunshot. And the dark black shadows on his shirt here, this kind of stuff. I mean, how many artists do you see in comics today that actually know how to draw wrinkles in clothing that look realistic? But I just, I love stuff like this. The use of shadow. And again, look at the excellent, <laughs> his excellent way of drawing human hair. Stylish 1950s human hair. Oops, here we have some ads. <laughs> Graveyard goodies. The Witch's Niche, Letters Pages, 1950s style. This story is called Till Death Do We Part. Um, oh, illustrated by Joe Orlando. And he's doing all the same kind of stuff. He's, again, a very different artist from Graham Ingalls, a very different artist from uh, Johnny Craig. He has his own style, but he's using a lot of the same techniques. Um composition, world building. Look, there's no words, and there's more world building in this panel than in a lot of modern comic books that spend pages and pages and pages talking about world building. And the only important thing is these two guys, these two thieves breaking in to rob this safe. The only thing that's really important story-wise is these two guys, but he's giving you all this information of where they are. He's framing them inside this window, inside this building, which makes it interesting to look at and draws your eye in. And he's also giving you the world beyond the building. So you know, you have a sense of what city they live in or the kind of city they live in um, along the docks, you know. There's some kind of a garbage uh, barge here or something like that. Factories, warehouses, uh, and this just ugly, smudgy sky. 
with the smog coming out of these smokestacks. I mean, there's no words. And look at all that world building. You understand exactly the kind of city that these characters inhabit. And there's not a word on the page other than the title. <laughs> Again, he's framing it through the window. Great characters. Great acting on this guy checking his watch to see how much time they have before the cops show up, I guess. Uh, I wonder if this story was a little bit inspired by the movie The Asphalt Jungle, which was a classic uh, crime movie at the time. Well, from the 40s, really, but but it would have still been popular. All these guys would have seen it when they were young because it was very popular. And it was a heist movie. I mean, that's what these guys look like. They look exactly like the actors in uh, The Asphalt Jungle. Look at this guy lighting his cigarette, and you get this interesting lighting on his face. It's just acting. You know, he's, they're thinking about what the characters should be doing in every panel. And, and again, the use of black. The shadows. That's the stuff I admire so much and the stuff I don't see in modern comics anymore. Everybody in modern comics is trying so hard to show off how much detail they can do and nobody thinks about the atmosphere. Um, look at this. Look at that. You know? Dropping these arches into black shadow. Just the hint of a car back here. But you feel the solidity of it because of the black shadow giving it a sense of mass. This ragged figure here. He's had a bad day. And you can tell. Look at his pose. Look at the way he's walking. And even the colors are not intrusive. You know, purple and green go together. That's classic color theory. They uh, oppose each other in just the right way. The red draws your eye in. Another great panel here. Look at this garbage can turned over in the foreground and rats jumping off of it. Again, world building, but it's all show, don't tell. Just great characters. And again, more of a crime story than a horror story. Yeah, I could go on and on about this stuff. And the last story in this issue. <laughs> Another crowd pleaser for... Uh, 12 or 13 year old Brian what's cooking by the legendary Jack Davis along with Graham Ingalls the other truly great master horror comic book artist of EC Comics <laughs> and then just look at that great zombie cooked zombie just he looks cooked the colors the black charred texture uh, the bits of uh Crispy flesh dripping off. <laughs> That's Jack Davis right there, man. And again, Jack Davis knows all the classic illustrator tricks, too, with composition and things like that. But his emphasis is on characters. Great, original, unique, interesting-looking characters with great faces. And that comedic, humorous style he has. Uh... If you're a comic book nerd watching this, you probably already know. I don't need to tell you. But Jack Davis would go on to become one of the main artists at Mad Magazine. And I don't mean to speed through a Jack Davis story, heaven forbid. But um, this video has gone on a little long and I probably should uh, keep it moving. I love this ugly guy. This is what's great about Jack Davis, too. This is not anatomically correct. You know, th that head... But it's stylized in a way where you believe in this character. And I love stuff like that. Um, who cares if it's anatomically correct? Look at the personality in this guy. <laughs> He's just the character. And they tie this guy up and they set his house on fire and leave him. Anyway, they burn the place down. And, and, and you know, here's another example of economy and simplicity you got this big monumental scene where they burn a building down but the important thing is the characters so he just gives you this little simple drawing of the building burning way in the background it's just black shapes and thin lines it's all it, it's barely a drawing it's almost more of a symbol <laughs> of a burning building but you get the idea um, and that's all you need to know he gives you just as much as you need to know and he keeps the focus on the characters that are talking, that are telling you the story. And then here's the 
<laughs> this is where it gets awesome. Where the burning guy comes back from the dead <laughs> as this charred corpse. Ah! <laughs> the great frightened faces that only Jack Davis can draw like that. And they go see what happens and he's like, Good Lord, I feel sick. He's going to puke. Herman Ditter's sizzling body hangs from the topmost spit before the now glowing embers. The fat rendered from his once obese body bubbles and gurgles in the immense cauldron. Bobbing in the boiling grease is the browned, seared remains of Charlie Marzen. <laughs> this guy's been broiled. And there's the guy hanging on the spit. And this one's been choked. Southern Fried. <laughs> and there's the Crypt Keeper signing off the issue. So that's The Haunt of Fear number 12. The 1973 reprint and the 1952 original. Um, classic issue of EC Comics. A good place to start if you're interested in EC, but you've never read them before. All the stories in this one are good. And the artists, obviously, as you've seen are top-notch. EC Comics, the gold standard for horror comics, and this is one of their best issues, in my opinion. So if you like this video and you'd like to see me review more horror comics, let me know in the comments. It might be a sort of fun thing to do on the side of my usual videos where I'm mostly just promoting my, my own work. Speaking of which, by the way, uh, if you like my take on horror, I hope you might check out my comic book series, Wolf and Batsy. The adventures of a ferocious werewolf and a cute female vampire as they wander the earth in search of a place to call home, but everywhere they go, they end up eating people and getting run out of town. It's not an easy thing to be a monster. You can order back issues of Wolf and Batsy on my website, brianbaugh.net. They're always available, and I actually have a crowdfunding campaign going right now for Wolf and Batsy issues 10, 11, and 12. And that ends on April 3rd, 2024, so... Hop on that while there's still time. Uh, this was fun. This was a fun video to make. Uh, talk to you later, guys. Bye.